It's only Wednesday. <laughs> only Wednesday. I don't want it to be only Wednesday. All right. It's only Wednesday. Ooh, a little bit of there. Hello, darkness. All right. What's the, what? What are we doing? Homework. Yeah. <laughs> homework. All right. So it says a forty-five kilogram rock is placed in a slingshot. That's number, oh, that's number 13. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Starting for rest, a crate of mass M is pushed up a frictionless slope by an angle theta with a horizontal. Oh, I hate this one. Okay. Now, well, I hate this one because I've done it twice already. <laughs> you didn't even do it once, apparently. Only 60 of you did your homework out of 74. I did start going through and grading, or at least looking at your homework. I mean, I'm, I don't really grade homework. I just give you credit for trying, but woo, woo. I had somebody at least tell me, well, Mr. Sheldon, I'm sorry, but I didn't submit it on time I, and it's closed now. What do I do? Oh, you suffer. <laughs> like you were meant to suffer there. I, I'm just talking to myself while I draw my little pictures. Okay, so box, ramp, and I need a better Microsoft boom, Microsoft <laughs> microphone boom. So I need to draw my force so that it is horizontal. There. All righty, we ready? So we don't have to do the problem the way they want us to, except the fact that they told us to do it this way. What I mean by that is there, you could have done this problem to find the velocity a number of ways. Um, probably the way you would have done it just two weeks ago would be net force equals MA and then find the acceleration, know that the initial velocity is zero and that the travel distance is going to be L and then, you know, figure out what the, how fast it's going. There, there's absolutely no reason why they're forcing us to do it this way, except that oh, they're in charge. So we'll do it the way they tell us. It's like being allowed to go to the bathroom. Somebody's in charge and they'll tell us whether we can go or not. So we're gonna do it the way they want, um, which requires us to consider the fact that there are different forces doing work. So there's gonna be the work done by the supplied force. That's one bit of work we can probably count on. To do that, let's, uh, let's go ahead and label some things. I'm gonna make that L. I know they want it in terms of H. I know they want that. Let's do that later. There's a triangle there. We'll, we'll put it in terms of H later, but for right now, our definition of work is based on going a displacement and that displacement is the length of the ramp. So I'm gonna put it in terms of all the things that we know about for a definition of work. So I have my applied force F, I have the length I'm going to push the box L and there's an angle of theta between the force and the ramp because the box goes up the ramp. Good, that one was easy, right? So next we've got gravity. Gravity is acting straight down. Mg, yay, gravity. Now, this one I know is going to bug you a little bit, but I don't care. When I consider what's happening here, the work done by gravity is gonna be Mg times L times the cosine of 90 plus theta. Do I need to explain why it's 90 plus theta? We have talked about it once, but I could talk about it twice. Can you explain it again? Oh. I know. I was really hoping that no one would take me seriously. <laughs> Nobody else does. Why, why would they be? Okay, so I'm going to put that there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you agree this is 90 degrees? Yeah. Would you agree this is theta? Mm -hmm. Would you agree that this is 90 plus theta? Okay. That's it, I'm good? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. No, I wanna get all that crap out of there. All right, um, there's another force acting on the box and I'm pointing it out because we, there's another way to do this problem, actually a couple more ways. There's a normal force acting on the box and the normal force does work on the box that's equal to N times L times the cosine of 90 degrees, right? It's up, but this way is along the ramp. So this is 90 degrees. So does the normal force actually do work? He asked, 
hoping somebody would give him an, at least a, a, a an, I don't know, maybe some body language about yes or no here, because you've been taught that since you were children, whether it's one of those. So is it yes or no? It is no, that's right, good job. Because cosine of 90 degrees is zero. The normal force doesn't have a component in the direction of motion. Now be careful. I, I wanna tell you that we could do this problem a completely different way in that they wanted this in terms of H. And something I have left out of our conversation because it, it, it doesn't conflict, but it requires that you understand this first before you can understand what I'm about to say. And if you don't understand this, what I'm about to say is just gonna distract you. And that is all of these forces that are acting here are considered conservative forces. And because they're conservative forces, they are path independent. Now, what that means is ultimately the box just goes up a distance H. That's what we're interested in doing is putting the box up a distance H working against gravity, we could do the entire problem in the Y direction only if we wanted and still get the right answer. But if we did the whole problem in the Y direction only, we would find that the horizontal force doesn't do work, the normal force does, because it's the only one that acts upwards. The problem is the normal force exists because of gravity and the supplied force. So, you could do the problem this way, but it's harder. I wouldn't do the problem this way. And if you do the problem this way, another problem exists, and that is if they add friction, you would be unable to do the problem that way because friction is not a conservative force. The longer you push the box across the ground, the more energy it takes away. And that's not path independent, that is path dependent. I've not talked much about path independence versus path dependence, but I will have to someday. And since you guys love to hear me talk, I'm sure one day that'll be a good day when we talk about the difference between path independence and path dependence. Because imagine, I have to say dependence and independence over and over and over and over again. That's a lot of coffee. So this is it. This is our three versions of, these are our three amounts of work to be done. We need to kind of crush those together and set them equal to the change in kinetic energy. This is a work energy theorem. That's what they want us to do. So the top one is going to be F L cos theta. Um, this next one's going to be trouble because I've got cosine of 90 plus theta, but I am a thousand percent confident that every single one of you knows that that's minus sine theta. I know that that's not true and somebody should probably ask uh, what, but it is. So would anybody like to do the uh, what? How many of you didn't know that cosine of 90 plus theta is equal to minus sine theta? You all knew it? You should know that. You should know things. It's okay for you to know things. I, I want you to know, know things. I wish you did know things. But it's okay. You do know some things. Like probably what the Kardashians are doing and <laughs> what Kanye is doing next week. You probably know some things. So we wanted what cosine of 90 minus theta was. Well, I'm sorry, 90 plus theta. So 90 plus theta is right there, right? So the cosine of this angle would be that length, agreed? Isn't that the same as saying the negative of this? That's why cosine of 90 plus theta is equal to minus sine theta. There's probably another way to prove it, but that's good enough for me and therefore good enough for you. So, and besides, if you're really paying attention and all three of you who are, watch this, there is a component of the force of gravity this way. And that component is mg sine theta and it opposes the direction of motion. So wouldn't we have expected this to be negative mg sine theta times the length? Mm -hmm. So that's not a surprise. It has to work this way because I could have broken up the weight into components and done the problem. I didn't, but I could have. All right, so I'm making this take way too long, but I've been doing this all day. So not that you guys have, why should you suffer? Well, because.
suffering. It makes me feel happy. F L cos theta minus M G L sine theta equals change in kinetic energy. Um, now L and let's just face it, co uh, sine of theta is H over L. So now I'm going to get rid of that L and put something for H. So H equals, oh, what am I doing? L equals H divided by sine theta. So that's going to be F H over sine theta cosine theta minus M G H over sine theta sine theta equals change in kinetic energy. All righty, bye-bye, bye-bye. And looks like I got a final answer of F H cotangent theta minus M G H equals one half M V squared. That'll do, that'll do. You gotta solve for V, I'm not worried about you guys doing that. But um, yeah, that, that's it. Now, before we leave this for a minute, is there any question about how we got here? Jack says no, so we're good to move on. But do you really realize what this actually tells us? If, if you've been paying attention in class, and I, I hope that you are, look what it really does. This is conservation of energy too. I gave energy to the box. How much energy did I give to the box? This much. Where'd that energy go? Well, some went into potential energy, some went into kinetic energy. So I just move this over to talk about where the energy is. We could have thought of this from as, as conservation of energy from the beginning. You give the box energy, how much? I gave it FL. That's how really how much energy I gave it. FL cosine theta. That turned into MGH and one half MG squared. So our statement of work energy theorem is conservation of energy all the way all the time. All right, good, I'm glad I made it take time. So now there's only 34 minutes left of doing homework questions. Next. Yes. 11, please. 11, please. 11, please. I don't give enough homework. I'm gonna give you like 25 next time. I want more variety. All right, so, no. Look, if I have to sit here and do all the homework for three hours, I, I want some more variety. Why would I make a joke about this? I think your test scores will go up if I give you more homework. I mean, you're supposed to be doing homework on your own to fill in the gaps for things that you have problems with, like a mature college student would. But if I add up all the evidence, I think that you might not be doing that. Right? I have lots of evidence. Would you like me to list it? 60 out of 74 people even submitted their homework. That's evidence. The average score on this homework assignment was less than a 50%. That's evidence. Well, I got more, but I think those two pieces, those two dots connect a lot together. So yeah, look, at some point or another, you guys have to take over. If you want, I'll be the math teacher. You get 40 problems every night, do all the odds or something like that. Grind it into you. But the idea here is that you're supposed to be coming self-directed in your ability to know what you know and what you don't know. And that's supposed to be the goal. You know, you want me to, I think I would hope you'd want me to be, to provide a certain amount of mutual respect where I don't have to give that kid who does get it 60 homework questions because they got it. They did their part or they just had natural talent. But then there's the kid who either didn't pay attention, slept through class, doesn't get it, and just doesn't have that natural ability. They need the extra practice. You know who you are in that spectrum. Now, you've known for years who you are, but I would argue that you're, you're human. Now, look, if I, if I want to see my test scores go up and not care about what you guys are learning as it comes to self-directed independent learners on your own, then yeah, I just, I just make sure we have about three to four hours of homework a week hour a night, I'll see my test scores up, I'll get a lot more $50. Or you guys recognize that, or, or you guys just buy Chegg and that, that doesn't serve the purpose too. 
or you guys take the self-direction here. Or you see a counselor. I mean, there is, there is that third option I keep forgetting. See your counselor, do something different. This class might not be for you. But like I said, I, my belief is if I wanna make you better college students, then I'm trying to put you in the driver's seat for figuring out what you don't know so that you can fill that gap. That's what it has to be. That's where you have to become self-directed. But I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't realize soapbox is over here. Let me get off that high horse. The, this is the sled dog problem, right? All right, so the sled dog problem, one of the biggest misconceptions about the sled dog problem is that you don't understand what they're asking you to find. They want the maximum amount of power that the sled dogs applied to the sled. So when I consider the sled, it's got, oh, it's a horrible sled. It's got a, that's just terrible. I can't, that can't go on the internet. No, 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 no. Not that this one's better, but at least it has the potential to be more sled-like, less, I don't give a care-like. There, nah, it's about the same. Oh, so sad. Anyways, the sled dogs pull in one direction and friction pulls in another. I don't really know if there's not really an angle involved. I don't really talk about it, but that part doesn't matter. They want the maximum power supplied by the sled dogs on the sled. And by definition, power is force times velocity. In this circumstance, this is the best choice to make. Mostly because they say that the applied force in the dogs is a constant. And they give us what the maximum speed of the sled dogs are. But what I do wanna point out is the speed of the sled dogs changes. This is a, a teachable moment here. I hope you're paying attention that the sled dogs start off the instant they start pulling on the sled, the sled has a velocity of zero. They apply no power to the sled. They're pulling, but the sled hasn't started to move yet. Power is related to how much work gets done. And as the sled accelerates and begins to move, work is being done and therefore we have power, but they want to continue to accelerate the sled, which means they're gonna apply a constant force, but the velocity of the sled is going to be increasing, requiring the dogs to output more power. Trust me, it's hard to continue to accelerate over a period of any long distance. You know, try it sometimes and try it while pulling a tire behind you or something. And you'll figure out that you have to work harder when you're already moving fast to go faster than if you're not going very fast to go faster. And that's why the power output is going to increase as the velocity increases. So in order to figure out the max, we have to look at the size of the force applied when we've reached the 15 kilometers an hour, which you will have to, of course, adjust to meters per second. Now, this force is not the net force. It's not MA. There are two forces acting on the system. They want the force from the dogs, but friction is taking some of that away and leaving us with MA. So if we want to actually figure out the force from the dogs, we need to include the frictional force too, because the dogs are overcoming that. So your total answer is gonna be mu mg plus ma times 15 with your conversion fact. And that should give you the max power. Is that it or is there a part B? What is the team's power output during the cruising phase? Well, cruising phase, they're not accelerating. So when they're cruising, net force equals zero, which means their applied force equals the frictional force. So P cruise is probably going to be way less because it's just mu mg times 15 times our conversion fact. Yay, me. Next. Yes, sir. Which one? 12. 12. All right. All right. Number 12. I didn't even look at the people at home. Did anybody at home raise their hand? No. Oh, all right. So Max is next. Um, Got into an argument about this question in um, in sixth period. I I don't take what I'm about to say lightly, 
So this is the lawnmower question. And if you guys have been in my class, especially more than one, one year, you realize I very seldom make this statement because books are well edited now. And it's hard to find books with a lot of errors in them. I disagree with the way this problem is done by the book. I think the book's doing it wrong. I think, I think there is an argument to be made for why they're doing it the way they're doing it, but based on what they ask, which, where am I looking, where's the question mark? How much power does the gardener have to supply? They're talking about the gardener's force on the lawnmower. Um, so I believe that they've gotten the answer wrong. I've granted full credit for everybody's answer. And I've looked at the answers you guys have submitted, the 60 out of 74 of you who did. And I think that there might be something wrong. Now, I, I'm trying to understand why they want the answer they're providing to make sure perhaps I'm not teaching you wrong. So I don't take lightly saying that I think the book is wrong, but I think the book is wrong. So let's talk about this, um, just so we have an understanding of why I think the book is wrong and all the things that you have to do to get to the answer here. So you're applying a force to the lawnmower. The lawnmower is experiencing a frictional force and travels at a constant velocity, which means that the net force on the lawnmower is zero. We've done this enough where I don't think I have to put a lot of this out there. So uh, you do your free body diagram and all that, and you'll figure out that the F cosine theta minus friction equals zero. And normal force equals mg plus F sine theta. Do I have to do more than that? Or you guys can draw your little pictures and stuff. If you need more, speak now, not later at seven o'clock tonight at tutoring, because I don't feel like doing that tonight at seven o'clock tonight at tutoring. Why is it plus sine theta? Uh, because the frictional, the, the force from the lawn, the force you apply is downwards and the weight is downwards. Um, never mind. Never mind, or I got it. I got it. All right. So there, drew the picture. So that being said, um, you're gonna have to put everything together. What we want is F, how much force does the, does the uh, gardener have to apply? Um, I'm, I, who mows their lawn at their house? Okay, so not everybody's calling up the gardener for a hundred bucks a month to go do their house. Good, good. How many of you do your own laundry? Excellent. The maid doesn't do it. Fantastic. How about um, cleans your house? Oh, the maid does that clearly. <laughs> How many of your houses the maid is mom? Cleans the house. Who cleans the house? Dad? Little brothers and sisters? Roomba cleaning service? No. All right. F cos theta minus mu times mg plus F sine theta. I know I'm combining a couple steps, but come on. It's not like we haven't done this before. It equals zero. We want the F cos theta minus mu F sine theta on one side and mu mg on the other side. Factor out the F and we get that F is gonna be equal to mu mg over cos theta minus mu sine theta. This is the force that the gardener applies to the lawnmower. I think the power output should be that force times the velocity. And that should be the power output. That's my belief because this is how much energy the gardener has to apply to the lawnmower. The book disagrees. The book wants to scale this with a cosine theta to indicate the amount of the gardener's force that's in the direction of motion of the lawnmower times the velocity of the lawnmower. Now, I disagree. I think if the lawnmower, if the gardener is, is wearing a fitness tracker, the amount of energy they're going to expend to push the lawnmower is equivalent to this, their force times the lawnmower, even though some of that force isn't actively pushing the lawnmower forwards, that force is creating the condition for the increase in frictional force and therefore, this is how hard they have to push on the lawnmower. They asked us about the gardener. 
they didn't ask us about the force from the gardener and its effect on the lawnmower. That's a different question in my estimation. Meaning they didn't ask how much power the lawnmower received from this applied force. I think that is where the cosine would be. And I know it seems like a finer point, but it's not because the ground receives some power from that force too. It's hotter now than it was because of the friction. But I think the lawn, the gardener, the gardener lost this amount of energy. I know it sounds like, why are we, why am I having this conversation? I'm, I can't even say I'm having this conversation with you. I'm just talking at you. But do you see the two differences there? And if you don't, then you're not, I hope you're not, you know, feeling like I'm talking over you too much. But the idea here is to try and understand physics. And in this exchange, energy left the gardener and went to the lawnmower. But some of that energy didn't stay with the lawnmower. It also went to the ground or whatever the frictional force, rolling friction, the axle or something. But their question is, how much power does the gardener have to supply to push the lawnmower? I think this is the power the lawn the gardener has to supply, his energy. Adding that cosine is how much the lawnmower received. Doesn't include how much the ground received. So I, it's a debate. And I want you to understand, I think it's worth having the conversation. I didn't realize all of you were getting it wrong. I just wanted you to do the lawnmower question because it's a pretty, pretty typical question out there. But I think... I think if you were asked about the gardener, you would not add that cosine there, which obviously reduces how much of the energy is, you know, being being tracked by our calculation. Yes, sir. So which question do you think uh, AP would ask? Um, I think AP won't ask about power. They'll ask about the work done, and they will probably focus the work done on the lawnmower, not the energy lost by the gardener. So they would probably ask how much work was done on the lawnmower by the applied force, which would include that cosine then. But like I said, that's not the question that was asked, which is why I didn't, I, you know, if they asked me how much energy did the, did the lawn, did the gardener lose? So like power tends to be a footnote. So they probably would not have done those in terms of power. That, that just tends to be, and the only difference is instead of having V there, you'll have the displacement of the lawnmower. That is the only difference for a constant force. But I think they would focus the question on the lawnmower itself and ask about the amount of energy that was transferred to the lawnmower. So I don't know that they would talk about how much energy was lost by the person who applied that force. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. So um, AP doesn't ask questions like this directly. They ask questions where there's an applied force and will want to know the work done by that applied force and even ones that involve friction and all of this but they're a little more careful about the way they ask the question itself so that you're not put in this position. They're gonna be, they're gonna provide more clarity about the question. And the ones I've selected for your test, they provide, they're very clear. So um, I tend to focus my question, you know, I tend to focus too though on problems that are less busy like this. This is heavy mathematics and I don't mind a lot of math, but I tend to try and I like, conservation of energy questions more than work energy questions, quite frankly. So anyways, there's that. That was way fun. My head's in the way of the whole thing though. So you guys at home, do, do I need to move my head? Bet. Look at Sam's all, uh-huh. Move, Mr. Shelton, your pain. That good, that better. Now I look just like Sam does when, when she's when she's like, you know, in her little box. All right, next question. Talked that one into the ground, but unfortunately that wasn't the whole class period. So there's more. I like how Maddie deftly just like wrote on her watch while she was trying to text her friend. So it didn't look like she was pulling her phone out. But we can still do that. What's that? Oh, that's right. Max had a question. Max is gone. I mean, all, all, all I see is his empty bedroom now. Max, what's your question? Yeah, not even there. Oh, Mr. Shelton. Oh, you're not Max. Could you do number uh, 13? I can do them all. I'm Mr. Shelton. Yeah. 
All right, what is number 13? Oh, come on. I'm just joking. This is the, it's got a graph. Love a good graph. Yes, I do. Love a good graph. No, I don't. I don't care. All right, so graph of force and display and distance. Yeah, well, big surprise. And uh, it goes up to 60, and over here it goes to 30. And these are CMs, not Ms. And these are, I hope, Newtons. Newtons, and I've got the curve. Good enough? Does that look like the picture? Eh, I don't care. Um, a 45 gram rock is placed in a slingshot and the rubber band is stretched. The magnitude of the force of the rubber band on the rock is shown by the graph. Yep, um, I hope you realize that this is F equals KX. Right? It's perfectly linear. So this is definitely just a Hooke's law problem because it's linear. Now, if it was a curve, then, then it would be a nonlinear spring. But this says the more I pull it back on the elastic, the more force I get, and it's perfectly linear. So it is, whatever the slope of that is, is K. In fact, not whatever the slope of that is, that's 60 divided by 0.3. That is the slope, which looks to be 200 Newtons per meter. That's gotta be the, the value of the spring constant of the spring. So I don't know what the problem asks, but there we go. Um, they give it in centimeters. I could have left that in centimeters. I could have done 60 divided by 30, which would give me two Newtons per centimeter. There's no rule that you have to be Newtons per meter when they're giving you all your values in centimeters, but you're always safest converting to meters, always. So 45 gram rock is placed in a slingshot and the rubber band is stretched. The magnitude of the force of the rubber band on the rock is shown in the graph. The rubber band is stretched 25 centimeters and then released. Woo what is the speed of the rock? Conservation of energy suggests that when the slingshot, which I am going to carefully draw for all of you because I am such an amazing artist. Look at that. This, is, you've never seen art like this. That's definitely true. You've never seen art like this. There, I have stretched. My, my, my elastic back, and then in a flash, I threw open the curtains and threw back the set. No, I did not do that. <laughs> and the rock flies away. Whee! So I'm thinking elastic potential energy here, kinetic energy there. All right, conservation of energy, strict conservation of energy. One half K x squared equals one half mv squared put it all in kilograms and meters you'll be happier so one half times 200 times 0.25 squared equals one half times 0 0.045 v squared boom drop mic is that it excellent excellent way to go slingshot how was that sam did I do it okay? Yeah, that's what I did, but I guess I didn't type it in my calculator correctly. Aw, sorry. Mr. Shelton. Yes. For that one, could you have just found the area? Yes. Because I did that. I did area of the graph equals one half mv squared. All right. Um, I'm glad you brought it up because you're, you're, you're my new pal. This, right, you went to 25 here, 25 centimeters, that's the area. No, the 30. No, mine says you pulled it back 25 centimeters. Well, mine was 30. Oh, fine. 30, jeez. It always sounds so sad anyways. Mr. Shelton. <laughs> but I didn't do it that way. Um, I just want you to notice that it's one half base times height. Let's get the height here though, because it's a triangle or thing. So the height here, I have to get from the slope, which is uh, two, right? You follow why it's two? Well, I'm sorry, that's not the height. The height is 60. All right, this is 60. So you would have put one half times 60 times 30. And then times 0.3. Oh, 
I did it in meters, so I wouldn't have to convert later. No worries. But what I'm trying to say is we could get the 60 from the fact that this is a straight line and that 60 would be equal to KX, which would be two times 30. Right, I'm just using the slope, the slope intercept form of the equation. And I, I wanna do that because I wanna show you that one half times two times 30 times 30 gives us one half KX squared. So finding the area under the curve is the same as using one half KX squared. Anyways, um, the reason why that might be a good thing to do, find it using the area under the curve is they don't have to make this a straight line. They could produce a graph that is of some other shape and finding the area under the curve might be the only way for you to figure out how much work was done. So I also want you to keep that in mind. All right, Max is back. He disappeared when I asked him for the question. He was gone, but now he is back. So Max, which one did you want to see? I thought you asked a different question earlier for the raising of hands. Oh, why did you raise your hand? I thought you asked if we had trouble with the lawnmower question for that one. Oh, yes, I had trouble too. Okay, yes. Are we gonna get a practice test? I don't even know who asked. Who asked? Oh yeah, okay. I don't know. I'm thinking about it. Because it said FRQ today. It's in homework practice and FRQ. Well, yeah, I, I, I was hoping we'd get there, but people keep asking homework questions. Are you going to post the FRQ? I was thinking about it. <laughs> I think you should. Okay, yes, I'm just toying with all of you. I have every intention of posting an FRQ practice test tonight. It's gonna to be an FRQ that is not weird. That's one I think is aligned with what you should expect on the test. I was gonna save this for the last few minutes when you said, yes, we're all done talking about homework, but you brought it up. So yes, I'm doing it in E&M and I'm doing it in mechanics. It's gonna happen after all of you chuckleheads leave when I'm in my room here by myself alone with my thoughts. No, it's just sitting on my computer. I haven't posted it yet. All right, so yes. And my expectation is you're gonna go home and complete it in 15 minutes. Maybe I'll post two, so you have 30 minutes of work so that you know, I can double the amount of homework like I promised. And then tomorrow, my ex expectation is we'll use that as our practice test in preparation for your test on Friday, which is going to be 15 multiple choice questions followed by two FRQs to punish the heck. I mean, no, that's the standard way I do the test, so we're good. But this time, the big difference is you will not be going home with a take home FRQ after this test, right? Nothing after this test. Just rip off the Band-Aid, put it in the trash, and walk away. All right. Yes, what? I don't think so. I will look at it, but I'm not going over anything. Maybe I'll go under it. I'm going to go under number nine. A 64-kilogram student is standing atop a spring in an elevator that is going upwards. Sure it is. All right, so elevator going upwards, student standing on a spring. Why the, why? Why is it always some student randomly walking into the elevator at the mall with the spring to stand on it where the elevator is going upwards? That, that seems very implausible, but here we go. So they're, um, they're standing on a spring and as the, the elevator ascends, the spring is depressed a certain amount. Um, just so you guys know, whenever you have a question with the spring, Treat it like it's a tension or a normal force. You'll be happier. Because right now, if I told you they were standing on a box, you would say that the person is experiencing an upward force of the box and a downward force of gravity. You would probably admit to me that they are not the same because the net force has to be unbalanced or else they can't accelerate. Which means that the normal force upwards minus the weight downwards would equal MA. But it's not a box. They're standing on a spring. So the amount of actual force comes from the spring. And now somebody's gonna ask the magic question, but you wrote that force is equal to minus KX every single time. And then you made a big freaking deal about why there's a negative sign there and how important it is. You're right. But I also made a big deal that when you're doing Newton's laws, you assign direction to your problem based on the direction of the arrows that you've drawn. What direction is the spring pushing on the person? Up. 
Therefore, in this function here, we've assigned the direction to be up. Interestingly enough, what direction does the actual spring compress? Down, which is a negative direction. So we're saying that the displacement is negative, therefore the force had to be positive. We're still following what it says here. We're just, we're not blindly putting in a negative sign. We never do, especially on vector questions. So I think that probably clears up most of the problem, but this is what you have to do. Um, so Kx equals mg plus ma. You're gonna solve for x, figure out how far the spring is compressed. I don't know if there's any other parts of this problem besides that, that's, no. no, that's about it. Any questions about that? All right, well, um, I still have six minutes. And since I'm still on the clock getting paid, you know I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep talking, unless you have another question for me. Why is this class an hour long? Well, it's not, it's just that because it's physics, it feels slower because it's more boring no, it than the classes. Okay, it's 57 minutes, sorry. It's but because, why is it that long? You're, you're not gonna like the answer, but I'll tell you the answer anyways. Somebody had to come up with a schedule of the day today that made lunch a little bit longer. And in their apparently massaging of the schedule, they couldn't find a way to make the lunch a little longer without not making the other classes like the right same length. They like couldn't figure it out. Now, what cracks me up about this is not only did they make this class a little bit longer than all the other classes, which they did. This isn't the first time they've done this. We do this every year, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, sometimes a Thursday. So it's not like this is the first time, but this is the first time they've screwed up so badly and made this class 10 minutes longer than all the others. I would say it's because they're cleaning, but that's not the reason because culinary cleans on their own all the time. So I don't, I don't know. I would say I didn't make the schedule, but I know who did. And therefore I am not surprised. How's that? Maybe this is why I'll never win teacher of the year. <laughs> but of course, if I made the schedule, I think, I think you'd be able to say, finally, I can leave physics because we're done. But that's not what it is. Mr. Shelton, yes. It's even worse because other classes were like shorter. I know. And some classes are longer. And that makes no sense. Either. I know. And probably the other ones were with people you liked better. Oh, no. But this one is with me. And that, that, that makes sure. And maybe, I, I don't know. Maybe you guys don't like each other very much. And I would have been okay with that. Make lunch a little longer. I would have sat here with my thoughts even longer. Because I came up here because I was under the impression my projector was going to be installed today. I knew it wouldn't be. I knew they were just teasing me. But um, yeah, I got a phone call from the office to ask if, and you guys at home will be very, very happy about this, if the plate had been put on the wall for the projector, the mounting board, that one right there. To which I said on the phone, yes, it's been there for about a year. Really, because the installers are very close. They don't want to waste their time and find out that it's not installed yet, like last time. To which I said, yes, last time in January when they came out and it wasn't, it wasn't there. So in February, they installed it. So, okay, I'll let them know, click, click. That was the second click was me because I didn't know she was just going to hang up without saying goodbye. So she clicked. I go back to teaching in the middle of several interruptions, which occurred because they were testing the, 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 the noisy stuff. So then she walks up here to verify the plates actually there as if I can't recognize a two by two piece of plywood screwed into the block wall. So I say to her, yes, it's right there with the instructions of how I want my projector installed on it which I put there for many weeks. But then as she goes to leave, I remind her that the installers have been out multiple times for over a year. The last time in June to tell me that they can't install it without the electrician to come out and run the line and no electrician has come out. So could you ask them if the electrician is with them? Because I paid an extra $500 when I found out in June that they wouldn't install it without the electrician. To which she said, yes. And left. I took the projector and got the boxes out here because I didn't want them to come in here and say we couldn't find the projector. Mm -hmm. I got the instructions, which is like the size of a Bible, put them out on the table. I got all the things. And then I grabbed my lunch from the auditorium and came right up here really fast, 
so that I would be here in case they had questions. But as you can see, nope. Now I know if I leave the projector right there, it's gonna get stolen some. So I will put it away because there's no way I'm gonna leave my $3,000 projector, which has been in this room for over a year now, there, as I wait for the district to not install it. So have a nice day, everybody. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. And yes, I'm the jerk teacher having a test on Friday before Thanksgiving. I am that jerk teacher. So there it is. You guys at home have a wonderful day. I will see you all later. And what if we just say that we think the bells aren't gonna ring? So how's that sound? Mr. Shelton. Don't know if that bell's gonna Yes, I have a, you have a question? No, just I just I just want to say I'd much rather have a test on the Friday before Thanksgiving than have one like on the day we're back. So like that actually was was really good because then we don't. Works have for me too. I, I want to give. I want to be done. I want to rip the bandaid off and walk away. So yeah, that's, that's what good. we're doing. So good. I'm glad I'm not too big a jerk. No, that's so. actually like, I'm glad that you did that. Me too. I just want to be done. I, I want. I don't want my kids to come home with homework over the break. You know, I want them to be able to walk away too. So yeah, we'll be done. All right, guys, have a great day. The bell did not ring. Oh, there it is. Bye guys.